All right, well, uh, good afternoon. I'm Richard Massey with C Plus S Engineer Magazine, which is a division of Zweig Group, a full service consulting firm for the AE industry based in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And today I'm doing a webcast with Mr. Brent Massey, who is principal and VP of operations for CEI Engineering Associates a firm based in Bentonville and established back in 1973. You have six offices in five states with 90 employees. So that's a pretty, those are pretty good numbers. How are you doing today, Mr. Massey? Doing great. Good, good. Well, we appreciate you meeting uh, with us today. Uh, we're going to talk about quite a few things, um, all of it related to architecture, engineering, and uh, management today. Uh, but the big prize that we're here to discuss, obviously, is the hydraulics and the waterworks uh, that were put in beneath the uh, dining hall and the North Gallery at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, uh, which has turned out to be not only a blockbuster for the art world, but a blockbuster for tourism, Absolutely. Uh, a blockbuster for uh, branding for all of Northwest Arkansas, uh, and more importantly, it's a great statement for um, what a great public entity, which essentially what Crystal Bridges is, uh, can do for people. Uh, there's already been, I think, over two million people have right. uh, visited the museum. Of course, priceless works of art, which we'll get into later. And uh, Brent, your firm uh, was uh, did the civil engineering for uh, this program. So, and I think it took you six years to get it done. Yeah, we, we worked on it for a while. And uh, before we get into some of the technical aspects, uh, what was it like being part of a program that has such national appeal? Uh, we, we were really privileged to get to work alongside the, the Walton family and, and of course, world-renowned Moshe Softy as an architect. What it did for Northwest Arkansas, as you commented, uh, an incredible project for our company, uh, you know, high profile, uh, very important uh, to the state, to the country as well, and as you said, the art industry as well as tourism, Northwest Arkansas, uh, all of those things. We were we were very privileged. It was a, a great project for us, uh, gave us a lot of recognition, and uh, just a real privilege to be a part of it. Yeah, and, and let's hit on that. That's one of the questions that I wanted to ask you uh, outside of the technical aspect is you have this program on your resume. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's going to go into the RFIP package uh, when you're looking for work. And how has that, being on your resume, how has that helped your business? Uh, it's it's one of those from a marketing standpoint. It's it's hard to trace it uh, uh -huh, right. exactly, uh, but everybody knows about Crystal Bridges, and to be able to uh, have that on our resume, to be able to uh, put in RFQs, SOQs uh, with Crystal Bridges as a part of our resume, uh, really does give us some credibility, especially in the hydrology and hydraulics. Uh, for those that have seen it, have been to it, who know some of the complications uh, associated with it. Um, it's a very technical project um, and something that not very many engineers have an opportunity to be a part of. And so that aspect does set us apart in some of those areas. Uh, at the same time, you know, there's there's challenges uh, with every RFP uh, sure. and competing. Uh, there's not many uh, museum projects out there. Right. Uh, so, so the challenge of having a museum on your project, you also have clients that say, well, we're, we're not building a Crystal Bridges. Right, we're not a museum. We're not a museum. Right. And uh, so there's trade-offs for that. But o overall, overwhelmingly, it's been a very positive part of our uh, marketing, a very positive part of our uh, statement of qualifications. Uh, you know, very good for us. 
Yeah, that, I, I, that, I'm glad you spoke to the marketing aspect of that. So uh, before we started filming, we were, were talking um, a big part of the Crystal Bridges program was obviously Moshe Safdi, uh, the internationally acclaimed architect. I think he's based out of Boston. Mm -hmm. And he wanted this museum uh, to sit three and a half feet above the water flow. And I know as an engineer, you were thinking that's too close for comfort. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and you'd mentioned kind of an arm wrestling match. Uh, talk about uh, that. I mean, Moshe Safdi is, he's good, but he's very demanding and he gets his way. Mm -hmm. So how did you, uh, how did your firm deal with that? Not only Moshe Softy is demanding and generally gets his way, but so does Alice Walton. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, childhood, <laughs> it was her childhood land. Right. And so she played on that land. She had a vision for what she wanted, uh, obviously, to bring Moshe Softy into that mix and be able to talk through what the two of them envisioned for a marquee project, a marquee museum uh, for this part of the country. Uh, they had a very succinct vision uh, going into the plan. The water feature was absolutely uh, critical for them to be a, an integral part of the design, a part of the museum. Um, proximity to the water was something that Moshe was very uh, set on. And as you said, from an engineer's perspective, we are uh, we're ultra conservative. Um, not only are they trying to put this uh, museum close to the water, but they're building it across a floodway. There's nowhere else for the water to go except through the project. Uh, that's unheard of. Most every engineer will tell you that you always have a good emergency spillway for the what ifs. And there's no, there's no emergency spillway at Crystal Bridges. 700 acres of drainage basin flows through the museum under two of the buildings and right up against all of the other buildings. It's built in the valley, uh, nowhere else for the water to go. And so there was somewhat of a, a wrestling match, if you will, um, of how close can we get it to the water? And our response was not very close. And their response was get it closer. Get it closer. Yeah. And so that went back and forth. And, you know, we, we did a lot of research in terms of trying to quantify that risk, uh, be able to qualify how much water can we handle, what is the risk, and, and you think about priceless works of art, uh, $35 million original oil of George Washington. She's got 10 Andy Warhols. Exactly. So how, how much risk are you willing to tolerate? And, sure. And at what point do you say, that's, that's too much risk? And so that was that was challenging. That We spent a lot of time in the early uh, design aspects uh, going back and forth on trying to understand. We say this is how much water you can expect and do you realize what that potential risk is and none of us can predict a 500 year storm or a 100 year storm or e even though the predictability says that it's every, once every 500 years, that's not really the, the case. Uh, the reality is those are probabilities. You can have a 500-year storm, you have Hurricane Harvey again tomorrow. Uh, sure. Those sorts of things are unpredictable, and so there was a challenge there to try to understand. Right, and for the uninitiated, it's the Town Branch uh, Creek and, and a uh, natural spring called Crystal Springs that feed this water feature, and there's two... Uh, wares, labyrinth wares there that can move 4,000 4,000 cubic feet per second. 4,000 cubic feet per second, which is 1.5 times a 500 year flood event. Correct. So um, having been to the museum about 20 times and being very familiar with the permanent collection and some of the exhibitions that go through, um, those are some big numbers. And um, you know, uh, the uh, Museum of Fine Art Houston uh, just survived Harvey. Uh, mm -hmm. and the Manil Collection, which is also in downtown Houston, survived. And that made national news in the art magazines, the mm -hmm. art columns. 
Do you keep track of those kind of things? I, I have to say I, I really don't. Uh, I'm not an art aficionado. Right. Uh, I've been to Crystal Bridges a lot and, and gained a lot of appreciation for art through Crystal Bridges. Uh, so Alice's, Alice Walton's vision absolutely uh, paid off, and in my case, exposure for people that have recently or have not been exposed before. But uh, no, I, I, I hadn't heard that until you said that. Right. Well, um, as you know, uh, these uh, webcasts, we have to identify four objectives, and we have to answer those objectives so that uh, folks who are, are watching these videos can get an educational aspect out of it. And I want to get to that directly. Uh, and I've read through the collateral that uh, went into all the research that you had to do, the 100-year flood, the 500-year flood, the 100-mile radius, the greatest rainfall ever recorded in the state of Arkansas, and just the deep uh, books that you had to go in to get. So, uh, you know, how do you identify the steps necessary to determine hydraulic design flows for critical projects? I think for us, uh, it was identification of risk first. Uh, risk. Yeah. We we go through the, the same protocol that, that any other civil engineer would have gone through in terms of analyzing the flood maps. You know, it's it's a uh, it's in a floodway. The property has about 1,300 feet of floodway. Um, and so we did the flood analysis. We ended up doing a, a full Clomer Lomer through FEMA uh, for right. the project. Um, so those are all the normal aspects that every civil engineer would go through doing your, you know, 10, 50, 100 year storms uh, for completion of that Lomer. Um, but the, the challenging part for critical projects is really trying to manage that risk. And so we did, as you mentioned, uh, we looked at precipitation uh, from the National Weather Service for a broad range of uh, area around uh, Crystal Bridges. A 100-mile radius um, essentially uh, was about a 9.6 inches in a 24-hour period was the record for anything close to us. Right, but there's more rainfall further out. There is. Uh, the state record for Arkansas is 14.6 inches. Uh, in a 24-hour period. And just to kind of put that in perspective, uh, Houston Intercontinental during Hurricane Harvey, their, uh, their greatest rainfall uh, was 16 inches in one day uh, in a 24-hour period. And that so just got beat. That, that was during that time. Right, uh, right. And, uh, you know, Houston Hobby, I think, had 10 or 12 inches per day. Uh, so we looked at Arkansas, um, and 100 miles around us to try to figure out what might, uh, what might be reasonable. We also went through the process of doing a probable maximum precipitation calculation, which is a, a fairly in-depth. Most civil engineers don't do that on a normal project. Okay. But in a critical project like this, uh, there are uh, methodologies out there to be able to do a PMP, a probable maximum precipitation. Um, Probable for, maximum per precipitation. precipitation. Yeah. Okay. And so that is really a calculation of what is the most rainfall that you could have theoretically for this region, these type of weather conditions, everything, the kind of the perfect storm. Ours is around 25 inches in a 24 hour period. Probable, probable maximum. Uh, and we went back and forth, as we discussed earlier, about, okay, what is that probability and, and how, how much, in our case, how much does a 25-inch storm raise the buildings off of the proximity to the water? And as you play with that, that was part of the equation for us to, to maximize the capacity of the weirs along with uh, minimizing the, the building to the water. Uh, and we basically uh, kind of came to the conclusion of a of a 16 inch storm uh, based on hydraulic or hydrologic data uh, within that 100 mile radius, um, other uh, maximums uh, outside of the 100 uh, 100 mile radius. We looked at Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, of course Arkansas. 
uh, even east into Tennessee and Kentucky, just to try to get a feel of what possibly could happen, and looked at weather, weather data uh, for all of those. In all of that, uh, we came to the conclusion of 16 inches, 16 inches. in a 24-hour period uh, was what everyone felt was a reasonable uh, calculation in terms of risk, and that, that translates into that 4,000 CFS. Right. Right, and uh, I know you didn't come to that conclusion overnight, so that was the real intellectual uh, stronghold of this firm is to, to figure out that 16 inch 24 hours. So uh, evaluate various hydraulic structures based on hydraulic performance, reliability, and ease of maintenance, which is big for this program because a log yeah. could come down there at any time. Absolutely. So. Uh, I'll start with that. You mentioned about a log or a tree. Uh, we're in the Missouri, Arkansas, Ozark region, and so we are blessed with a lot of hardwoods um, and very steep ravines. Right. Uh, about 100 feet of relief from the upper parking deck of Crystal Bridges down to the water, um, and it makes for some steep slopes that trees fall. Uh, they get washed down the creek uh, during flash floods. And so that's a part of the, the calculation uh, when we looked at that risk. Um, being able to determine a structure that was reliable in terms of being able to work in a whole multitude of circumstances. Uh, we looked at a lot of different options. We looked at sluice gates, which is a primary, when you look at high capacity uh, dams, small dams across the country, whether those are Corps of Engineer dams, uh, hydroelectric dams, almost all of those use a sluice gate system because it's a high capacity, uh, high volume uh, type mechanism. The problem we found in our application was that sluice gates require power and we could not afford to take a risk. Because that's a maintenance issue. It's a maintenance issue um, in an emergency, in right. a catastrophic event, which is what we were prepared for. That's the first thing that happens is power goes power out. Power goes right. out. Yeah. Now you have to have generators and backup and all those kind of things, which has an aesthetic implication for Moshe's design. Right. And so that was not really a, high, uh, a highly sought after issue either, to have a lot of backup generators or things that required you know, multiple facets to, to ensure reliability. And so, when we looked at the labyrinth weir, uh, it's somewhat of a simple design in terms of the construction of it. It's concrete, reinforced steel concrete structure um, that allows for very limited low maintenance. It's not reliant on power. It's not reliant on someone to throw the switch or to open a valve or to have somebody there at two in the morning when when the storm of the century hits. And so for all those reasons, we went through that reliability right. statement. We went through the ease of construction. Uh, we went through the ease of maintenance. It doesn't have any seals or gaskets like a sluice gate or other valves. Uh, there's no manual. Core uh, drilled into the bedrock. It is. Right. 18 inches thick right. concrete. Um, so it's a it should stand the test of time. Yeah, fantastic, yeah, and, uh, and reading about the program, it was, it was neat because uh, it's called a labyrinth wear, and basically it, in a compressed area, it allows for a greater floodplain. Correct. Right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's actually, it's simple. I mean, the math is complex, but it really comes down to, it just creates more space yeah, that's in a, in a nutshell, kind of that zigzag pattern of a labyrinth weir allows you to put two to three times the volume of water as opposed to a, a normal weir structure. Good, and now let's get to uh, objective four. Uh, recognize options for non-traditional design and construction in and around floodways. I know you've kind of hit on that, but I'm sure you've got a few more details for that. Yeah, so, you know, for most of us as civil engineers, um, we generally practice the by-the-book standards. Uh, 
not uncommon to do a, a clomer loamer process, not uncommon to make modifications in, in the, uh, uh, the floodplain. Uh, most folks are not uh, constructing a building in the floodway and across the floodway. Uh, most folks don't operate without an emergency spillway. And so normal, uh, normal protocol, normal civil engineering, uh, we tend to get stuck inside the box. And in our case, you know, we were prompted from the outside to be able to solve a problem. And that problem was we want to build it here, we want to build it in the valley, we want to build it across the water, and we want it close to the water. Solve the problem. And that challenge uh, is a great thing for engineers. That's what we're trained to do. We're, we're skilled and trained to solve problems. Sometimes we have to remember that there's not a confinement of problem solving. And for us, uh, we were prompted and, and uh, kind of kick-started uh, with Moshe Softy uh, being somewhat demanding. Uh, but the challenge, I think, for all civil engineers is to recognize, and the cliche is, is out there used too often, you know, the out-of-the-box thinking, but sometimes there are ways to get around um, what is the norm? And in our case, uh, we absolutely were able to look at different options. Well, what if? What if we did a probable maximum precipitation? What would it say? What about um, a non-traditional type weir? And we had never designed a labyrinth weir before. Oh, okay. And so we did a lot of research. Uh, we looked at a lot of different options. And that's part of the civil engineer's job is to find ways to solve the problem. Right. And that's what I would encourage other people is to really consider, um, you know, and, and we tell our young engineers all the time, let's figure out a way to solve the problem. Um, and it's not always the conventional methods. Good, yeah. And, and in this case, you, you went with simplicity. Simplicity in that there's not a whole, there's no gaskets, yeah. there's no flip switches and, and yeah. all those kind of things. It's right. more of a, a movement thing than uh, the latest gadgets right. or some, something that hasn't been tried before. Right. Um, but this one is, is unique. And now um, a question outside of the, uh, of the four objectives that we have to cover is how did you grow from this process? I mean, dealing with Alice Walton, who is one of the wealthiest people in the world, mm -hmm. uh, from a groundbreaking corporation that changed consumer habits across the planet, mm -hmm. particularly here in North America. And Moshe Safdi on top of that, I mean, you've got these big names. I mean, you're from Missouri, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So how did, how, did, how did you grow from this process? I, I think as a firm, uh, I think we grew from a standpoint of being able to conquer and, and tackle uh, some things bigger than, than what we would normally uh, take on. Um, and the challenges that go with uh, taking on new technology in terms of a labyrinth weir, uh, you know, different ways that we had to model, uh, model that, that structure. Uh, things that we had not done before, that was good for our firm because it, it kind of opened our eyes a little bit to say, you know what, man, we, we can solve problems uh, right. beyond just the normal, beyond just the regular civil engineering. Um, for me personally, you know, it, it was a, uh, a very challenging project. Um, did you get I, any gray hairs over it? I probably did. I was probably... Uh, jet black before I started the, the, <laughs> right. the, the program, but you know, lots of uh, lots of tight deadlines, a lot of pressure uh, from a standpoint of uh, they made the announcement of the 11, 11, 11 opening day. Well, they made the announcement for 11, 11, 11 after several deadlines had come and gone. Correct. So that 11, 11, 11 became the end all be all deadline it because did. several had been missed over a couple of years span. Yeah. And they they basically acknowledged that and said, Okay, 
no more. No more. Yeah, you this one really it. is, and we're going to open one way or another. Uh, and that that was definitely challenging. And then just you know uh, the confines of the project. Uh, you're in a valley. Uh, contractors basically working his way out. You know, right. backing out uh, in the construction process. Um, all of those challenges. Being a high-profile project, having demanding clients, uh, a big team of a lot of people working right. at a lot, uh, you know, all of those things, I think from my standpoint, uh, just a great growing experience for me in terms of the construction aspects. You know, we were problem-solving right up until, you know, 11, 11, 11 at probably 11, 11 that day. Sure, yeah. Um, but problem-solving all the way and things that you had not experienced or things that you couldn't anticipate and, and you had to engineer as we went. Uh, a lot of design build things that happened in the field that we had to take care of and you know, be flexible and learn, learn as you go uh, and really be adaptable and flexible. Great, well, um, <clears throat> Brent, I appreciate uh, all the input on uh, this particular program. Uh, I think you've answered a lot of the questions that we came here to get for this specific um, uh, portion of the webcast. Uh, as you know, that we are going to be going out to the actual site yeah. and we'll film there too. And that's when I'm going to ask you a little bit more about the color of being down in this big hole. Yeah. You know, trying to dig your way out and, and create this, uh, you know, the, the, the backbone of this museum. I was at the groundbreaking. I watched the thing be built. So I know how deep that hole and how red it was uh, <laughs> when it was not that, what we see now. Yeah. And so we'll get into the color and, and the real problem solving that you have when you've got red dirt on your boots. Yeah. Um, and we'll conclude filming for now and then what we're going to do is we're going to come back and I'll ask you a few management questions in general for the AE industry and then we'll be done for the day. Okay. Great. Sounds good. And we're back with Brent Massey. Uh, Brent, you've spent your whole career with CEI, um, 22 years, correct? Correct. And um, not only have you been with CEI, but uh, out there uh, for the rest of the country, uh, northwest Arkansas, where Bentonville is located, is a boom market. And so the total population went from about, I don't know, 120,000 25 years ago now to 500,000. And they're building out the infrastructure as we speak. I went by the Northern Bypass today on my way up here, and they said the population could eventually get to a million people. I don't know if I believe that, yeah. but I know it's gonna get bigger than 500,000. And uh, I know that the recession hit, um, but Northwest Arkansas recovered quickly, mm -hmm. yeah. relatively speaking. Yeah. So talk to us about, um, you know, uh, you don't have to, uh, talk forever but tell us a little bit about how it is competing and working in a very hot market like this uh i would say it's it's the best of both worlds it uh it is challenging uh it's still very competitive in northwest arkansas there are a lot of great firms here uh but in in the boom market uh before the recession you know there was there was work for everybody, everybody. yeah uh, everybody decided they were going to be a developer, right. uh, and in land development, uh, that was that was good, uh, and some not so good. Uh, post recession, as you said, Northwest Arkansas recovered very quickly, uh, rebounded very well, and is is not at pre recession levels, but very robust right now. And the the challenges there, we have the same challenges as other people across the country in terms of. Labor market is still very tight. Yeah, we're going to talk uh, about that in a bit more detail. And you know, and and it's still somewhat competitive in the market um, as far as fees, uh, but there's a lot of things going on. And so, the very uh, the good things about the market, diversification of the market uh, from a land development side, 
uh, commercial office. Uh, multifamily has had a resurgence in Northwest Arkansas, and we've been fortunate to be a part of that. Uh, single family housing has not really come back to uh, the level that we would like to see it. Uh, okay. Anywhere close to what the what the pre recession was, but it's slowly coming back. Uh, inventory is getting getting absorbed, and mm-hmm. so we're seeing a, a a minimal start into the uh, the single family residential, but. Overall, uh, the market is very good, and uh, uh, we've been fortunate to have a good reputation in the market. Crystal Bridges obviously Crystal Bridges helps, helps out. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we've been in the market 43 years, and, and so... Uh, yeah, founded in 1973. Correct. And so we're, uh, we are uh, continuously uh, trying to diversify and grow our business, uh, and Northwest Arkansas is a great place to do that. Great, and, and uh, so you had spoken to it earlier, uh, and this is something that uh, I go through as a journalist in the AE industry, is, and they're, they're all talking about, uh, is the talent crunch. I mean, it's easy to get someone straight out of college, but that's not everything you need. You need that 10-year PM level person yeah. who can go onto a work site and get it done, and those people are, are in very short supply. So how are you? How are you getting your people? Yeah, and I would even go one step further. The uh, the labor market uh, not only is it tight in terms of talent for those ten year folks, but uh, even a lot of the market, uh, a lot of the talent left the market completely, left the industry. Right. That's right. And and now uh, salaries have come up. Uh, even starting salaries for those college grads uh, have. A much higher labor cost uh, than they did uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I wish that fees and, and our professional fees had risen at the same rate that oh. our labor costs yeah. have, but that's not been the case here in Northwest Arkansas or even in, in other regions of the country where we have other offices. Um, but I would tell you that, that we are challenged, uh, as most firms are, uh, to find experienced folks, uh, both the technical in terms of PEs and landscape architects and, and professional surveyors, um, as well as CAD staff. And uh, even, you know, we, we talk a lot about graduate engineers, and, and uh, b- there's just not a, not a lot of CAD staff out there either uh, to backfill some of the production uh, staff. And so we've, uh, we've incorporated... Uh, uh, headhunters, we oh yeah uh, increased our budget in terms of recruiting. Uh, we've expanded the net, cast a broader net uh, in terms of recruiting. Uh, I think we have subscriptions to just about every uh, every website that uh, in terms of recruiting and employee placement. But uh, uh, it's a it's an all of the above assault on trying to to get folks in the door that that we really believe can help us uh, grow and diversify our business. Good, yeah, that's a comprehensive answer uh, to that question. And now, uh, uh, your receptionist seemed like a nice lady. Yeah. And um, so, uh, how's your company culture? I mean, what what is one of the things that you do to make sure that your people are happy and that they get along and do, do what they gotta do? You know, we, we were founded as a small company. Um, and we've, we've kept some of that small company mentality, uh, but we're also CEI engineering associates. Uh, we're, a, we're a corporation, right. and we run our business as a corporation. Uh, it, it doesn't have somebody's name on the front door, um, but we've still been able to maintain that, that culture. Um, we've always had a good work share program where we've shared work across multiple offices. Um, that actually was intensified in the recession because the, the reduction in staff, people had to do you know, more things with less, and we all kind of had to wear multiple hats. We were fortunate to be able to continue that work share process beyond the recession, and we actually strengthened our ability to share work across offices because of the recession. And that, that's been a real... Uh, real shot in the arm for us. Allows us to handle uh, an influx of work or if we've got areas of the country that may be in a lull 
it allows us to balance our workload. And so that aspect of kind of a corporate culture, all for one, one for all, uh, we've, we've done away with profit centers and, and took out some of the competitive aspects, internal competitive aspects. Oh, okay. Uh, we've had that in the past. Um, but those are things that from a company standpoint, company culture, uh, take care of clients. Uh, we have a, a list of guiding principles that uh, talk about everything from, from giving back to the community uh, to being able to put clients first. Uh, but a lot of what we are uh, built around is, is that culture that everybody knows everybody. And if you've got something to get done, there's probably somebody there to to back you up and help you get it out the door. So work share. Right? Absolutely. And uh, one more question before we go, uh, and we've got so much great stuff today, but you know, you've got offices uh, in a lot of different places, uh, California, Minnesota, of course, here in Arkansas, and in Pennsylvania, but you've also got uh, an office in Dallas, and you've got an office in Houston, mm -hmm. and those are real big, heavy-hitting markets. So. Um, Dallas is one of the most dynamic markets in the entire world, actually. Yeah. So how did you get into Dallas and Houston? We, we specifically opened an office in Dallas. Um, I'd have to look at our history to remember exactly when, but um, probably late 90s, early 2000s, okay. with a specific focus to diversify our client base and go after a market at that time was good, but not anywhere in the significance that it plays in today's right. world. Um, and we were able to grow with a, uh, Dallas is our second largest office behind the Bentonville office. Okay. Um, and we have a, a pretty wide footprint there, uh, predominantly in land development, parks and rec, uh, some industrial uh, warehousing. Um, so that was a, a big push for us, a strategic, uh, we opened an office, transplanted a uh, leader from our Bentonville operation to open the office in Dallas. Houston, uh, we had a couple of clients there uh, when we opened the Houston office and we basically opened it as a satellite to Dallas. Okay. Um, uh, probably four or five years after opening the Dallas office. And so Houston has supplied and, and taken care of clients in that market, uh, both based there and operating uh, retail outlets in that market. Uh, so it was a more specific to clients, where Dallas was more of a strategic uh, diversification effort. Both of them have been good offices for us. Uh, still, still want to grow both of them uh, even, even more, take advantage of the markets that are there. But you're absolutely correct. Both of those markets are very good. And good morning. This is Richard Massey with C Plus S Engineer Magazine. And I am with Brent Massey, who is Vice President and of Operations and Principal at CEI Engineering. Associates uh, based in Bentonville. How are you doing this morning? Very good. Thank you, Richard. Good. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, this incredible labyrinth wear system that CEI installed uh, several years back to control uh, the floodway uh, and, and the waterway that runs just three and a half feet uh, beneath uh, these priceless works of art here at Crystal Bridges Museum. And so I uh, just wanted to go ahead and open up and talk to you a little bit, Brent. Uh, it's an incredible program, and Crystal Bridges has turned out to be one of the premier uh, museums in the United States. So uh, before we get into anything technical, uh, tell us about, you know, the emotional, the spiritual side that you got yeah. out of uh, being such a big part of this big program. Well, it really was an amazing experience for us as a company, uh, for me personally, uh, to get to work on a project of this magnitude uh, doesn't come along very often. It's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime project for engineers, uh, for our company. Uh, it's had a profound effect on northwest Arkansas and, and the state. Uh, for us, you know, it was just a, a neat project, a lot of stress as we talked before. Sure, that we'll get uh, back into. But but you know, really challenging technically, but uh, uh, very uh, exciting from a standpoint of uh, not many projects like this 
in the country, uh, only a handful in the entire world that have labyrinth weirs, and, and I don't know of really any that have priceless works of art sitting right on top of a labyrinth weir. Uh, so that, that's a pressure cooker of uh, just the stress that goes with that, and as we kind of talked before, every time it rains, you know, heavy rains, yeah. we, we kind of uh, make sure everything's okay and check with the building and grounds director and make sure everything is going well. But uh, so far, so good. Great, and uh, for the uninitiated, we're at Crystal Bridges on site right now, and behind us is the dining hall, and what you can't see north is the uh, North Gallery, uh, which are the two principal pieces of this architecture that are installed with the wares. And let's get down to the actual construction of this. Uh, at one point in time, this was a big uh, red dirt hole in a ravine in a remote part of Benton County. So how was it working in, in such a challenging setting? You know, this was the, the childhood home for Alice Walton. And so 100 acres basically here on site of very, rig, uh, very rugged uh, ravines, uh, the creek that flows through the bottom of the, of the property. Um, it's about 100 feet of elevation change from up on the top of the parking deck uh, to down here where we're at it. Quite a at, bit. At uh, creek level. Uh, and so that's challenging in itself. The fact that everything uh, in the construction site is at the bottom of the bowl. Right. And so every time it rains, water comes to the construction site, which is totally backwards from most construction projects where you route water around the construction site. In this case, everything is coming to the construction site. Uh, we ended up building a, uh, an underdrain system, a, a pipe system that bypassed the creek underneath the entire length of the construction, which is about a quarter of a mile, uh, about 1,500 feet uh, from the south end of the project all the way to the north end of the project. So during that time, everything is happening in the bottom of this ravine and construction activity, uh, all the trucks, all the equipment, everything is, is down here and everything of the outside world is all up there. Right. And so, you know, the challenge with that for the contractor, uh, just very difficult conditions, uh, lots of equipment. Uh, in harm's way in terms of any kind of potential flash flooding. Uh, all of those kind of things happen on this project. Uh, just a part of everyday uh, normal Crystal Bridges activity after the first couple of years. Right, so you got a little mud on your boots. Absolutely. Well, uh, you had told me a great anecdote uh, during our prior interview, uh, at least before the camera started rolling, that at one point in time that you uh, were under the belief that former President George Bush was going to be here for the uh, groundbreaking for this museum. Mm -hmm. So you really had to, to get, put the horsepower on it and describe the fact that uh, at least you were under the belief that one of the most powerful people in the entire world was coming here. Yeah, we, they had made the announcement for a, a opening date of 11-11-11. Uh, November 11th, 2011 had been announced. Uh, there was a, a pre-opening VIP uh, that was going to happen, I forget exactly how many days, two or three days prior to uh, the grand opening. And at that time, uh, George W. Bush, then President and, and First Lady Laura, were supposed to be at the uh, festivities. I don't know if they made it or not. We happened to be uh, in the hole. Uh, lights on, uh, construction still going on at whatever, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, uh, trying to finish all those last little details of every project that, you know, all you lack is finishing. Uh, we were right there in it. Uh, like I say, VIP reception was going on. Uh, we weren't invited to the reception. <laughs> we had uh, priority to get the project done. Right, well, good. So that was a lot of motivation and a lot of incentive uh, to get this done. Uh, describe, uh, you know, finishing something like this and having rain events coming through there and what you go through thinking that, you know, is it, is it done? Yeah, uh, challenging because all of everything we had done uh, is working to control the floodway, uh, all the hydrology, the hydraulics, everything was uh, supposed to work at a finished product. But what do you do in the interim? 
And in our case, uh, we got challenged a couple of different times with the weather. Uh, April of 2011, you know, six months or so before uh, grand opening, uh, the weirs were not even complete at that time and uh, no pond liner in, lots of those things. Uh, pretty, pretty good sized flood event, probably a 20-year, 25-year storm. Um, that challenged us before construction was over. Uh, when we started with the pond liner and, and kind of as you have to work your way out, uh, where we're standing here, there's no access. Once the, the two buildings were put on the weir, there's no way to get construction equipment in and out. Okay. The cranes were all removed by that time, and so we literally had to back our way out from a construction standpoint to be able to uh, complete the project. So what you're looking at here behind us, all of the liner of the pond uh, was laid in from the downstream end, uh, from the north gallery uh, backing out, and then they completed the last section of weir, drove the last piece of equipment through the weir, started forming the, the concrete weir section, uh, and if it would have rained a substantial event at that time, everything upstream of that main weir uh, would have been flooded and everything inside here in the, in the pond uh, would have worked perfectly. But uh, on the upside, we were, still, we were still backing out, working our way out of the project, uh, even to uh, grand opening day, we were uh, doing the final touches. So. Yeah, well, um, construction was about six years, correct? Uh, construction total was around was around four, I think. Okay. We, we worked on it a couple years before breaking ground. Right, so describe the, the uh, just the, the stress test, the, uh, the mentality that you had to have to, to work on a program that, that takes that long to get done. How did you manage that from, from your manpower standpoint and dealing with your contractors and whatnot? I, you know, for uh, the better part of the six years that we were involved in the project, um, we had a pretty consistent staff. The project engineer on the project did a lot of the calculations and, and early engineering. Um, we did have some staff turnover during that time. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a real positive. Uh, the construction team uh, was pretty well intact. Uh, they brought on a new construction manager uh, during the the last three years of the project. Oh, okay. And so that that was a good thing in terms of helping get that direction and and making sure that we were all on task. Right this, to get someone in there that could yeah. close the door on this thing. Yeah, and so they reported to the to the owner, um, mm -hmm. and of course, the consultants and the contractor uh, working together to try to continue to complete the project, but. You know, through all of those things, the the challenges, the stress that goes with that, uh, it is a mega project. Um, you know, roughly five hundred million dollars. I don't know what the final price right. tag was, but uh, such an important project uh, for the owner, important project for the region, um, and so you've got a lot of people uh, in all the trades, uh, both. Uh, not just our part from an engineering standpoint, but you've got other professional consultants on the design team, the architects, the structural engineers. Uh, you've got lots of trades for the contractor who are all pulling for the same goal, but have individualized, uh, individualized goals of things they have to complete, uh, timing for that. Um, and in, you know, all of those things, uh, everything had a, a a connection to the creek in terms right. of lots of things you can't do if you can't get equipment into this area um, but there's things going on outside of that finishes inside the buildings uh, some of the architectural components still going on uh, but also staging all those different pieces and parts a construction project of this magnitude uh, challenging in all aspects Right. Uh, well, what kind of uh, reception did you get from Moshe Softy and Alice Walton once you were done? Was there any direct contact that you had with them? Not directly. Indirectly, of course, they recognized the work that we had done and, and uh, you know, gave accolades to the design team and, and the construction team. And, and really, we felt uh, very proud to be a part of all that, uh, to see the project come together, uh, to see Moshe's vision turn out uh, when you look at the pre-construction renderings and, and the post-construction open facility, 
uh, it, it really is an amazing piece. And, you know, to hear Alice Walton talk about it, uh, how pleased she is with, with how it turned out. Um, they were gracious in, you know, congratulating the design team and the construction team. Uh, I didn't personally uh, get, a, get an invitation, <laughs> but, but uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm good with that. Sure, sure. Well, now, uh, the babbling noise that you might hear in the background is obviously uh, Town Branch Creek, which is flowing through here, which is also fed by uh, Crystal Spring. Mm -hmm. And so explain uh, to our uh, viewers what's happening right now. So the water you hear uh, right now is uh, basically flowing through uh, three low flow components of the weir. Uh, so normal conditions as we are today, we haven't had any rain events in the last five or six days. Uh, the creek flows around 100, 150 gallons a minute, varies a little bit throughout the year. The spring is pretty consistent, about 150 to 200 gallons a minute. Okay. And so those two components feed the creek full time and uh, responsible for not only the sound that you hear, uh, but also for filling the two ponds, the upper pond. Uh, the pond behind us, about a million and a half gallons of, of water. Uh, the upper pond uh, that we'll see later, uh, about two and a half million gallons. And so the creek naturally fills that. Uh, there's aeration and, and circulation in, in both of the ponds to be able to help with, uh, with water quality. Um, but you hear the water flowing over the low flow. Uh, if we were standing here at, the, uh, at a rain event, a pretty heavy rain event, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to hear us talk. It's oh, uh, okay. it's a pretty uh, deafening, deafening sound of hearing the water coming over at full speed, uh, coming over all five cycles of the labyrinth weir. And now it flows uh, <clears throat> south to north. It does. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. And and so uh, what's the difference between the southern barrier and the northern barrier? Any? Uh, a very slight. Uh, differences in the geometry, uh, mostly because of the confinement of the, of the buildings, uh, the two galleries, uh, the dining hall and the north gallery and the ancillary pieces, uh, the lobby area is a little bit different uh, for the dining hall mm -hmm. uh, weir, but generally the same basic geometry, the same uh, basic height. Uh, we're on the back side of the uh, of the dining hall labyrinth weir right now and so you see about 15 feet of distance from the gallery down right um, on the upstream side of that if if we see the gallery uh, and we'll be able to see that a little bit later um, you'll see that three and a half feet uh, from the bottom of the building down to the labyrinth weir and another three or three or four feet from that uh, for a total of about seven feet from the water's edge to the to the floor of both galleries so very similar in the design uh, both of them operate about the same way okay well uh, now will we will the water ever crest over that absolutely oh it will it it comes right through that gap that you see um, in the uh, total design event uh, so that just, could be covered with water absolutely um, right up to the edge so the right. the 16 inches that we um, designed it for the 4,000 uh, cubic feet per second it just uh, comes to the bottom edge of what you see is the bottom of that bridge structure so oh. just millimeters away is what we uh, we have said the, the 4,000 CFS would flow through that small opening Incredible. So uh, we've got school students. Uh, we can hear them in the background. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, that just goes to show you that, um, you know, people really enjoy this museum. Uh, they're getting mm -hmm. a lot out of the facility. Uh, and before we move on to the next stage of our conversation, uh, you know, what do you think? I mean, we've, we've got all these students out here. They're enjoying the engineering of this yeah. building even though they don't know it so right. how, how does that make you feel seeing that right now you know I, I, I think it's pretty cool to see the kids um, and there's educational parts beyond just the art uh, you know they do a lot with the architecture the engineering the landscape architecture of the grounds and so there's a lot of avenues for learning and of course Alice Walton that she saw that as part of her vision for this museum that it would have an impact 
on millions of people. And so uh, we get to play a small part in that, and, and it's pretty cool. Great. Well, uh, I appreciate your time today, and thanks for talking with us. Great. Thank right. you. Rick. Thank you, sir. Well, here we are at the uh, kind of the north end of the project. Uh, behind me, you can see the, the exit of the labyrinth weirs from under the north gallery. Uh, can actually look back up in the background and see underneath the buildings all the way back to the, uh, to the dining hall gallery and see the weirs from the backside. And the, the cool part about this part of the project is this is where the transition comes back from, uh, from really being 100 foot wide through the project corridor back to transitioning to just a, uh, a pretty small uh, 15, 20 foot of width for the floodway. Uh, and then that natural transition from the project back into that minimalistic footprint that, uh, that Moshe Softy and Alice Walton envisioned uh, back to the natural terrain that, uh, that is the beauty of Crystal Bridges. And so you get to see a little bit of everything in the background, a little bit of the, the relief from the building down to the water level, the final pool, uh, a little bit of a waterfall effect uh, exiting the pool. Uh, and then again, the, the riprap and the uh, flood protection uh, around the corridor of the stream. Uh, so that gives you a, a, a full view from kind of the south end of the project all the way here to the north end and everything in between. Well, we're here uh, in the dining hall, the south labyrinth. We're uh, looking back to the south, uh, looking at Town Branch Creek. Uh, this is really gives you a, a visual of what Moshe Softy had in mind when he was talking about having the experience of the buildings very close to the water. And so we're about seven or eight feet uh, from the water level at this point, uh, standing here in the dining hall. Uh, you can see Town Branch Creek flowing into uh, the museum area behind me. Um, the, the area that you see uh, here to the south of me uh, as I said before, is about two and a half million gallons of water filling this pond. Both ponds are lined uh, with a bentonite clay liner. Uh, and so we've got uh, just an opportunity to, to really showcase uh, what's going on with the creek and uh, uh, the proximity of the buildings. As you see, the, the rock channel, uh, rock line channel to be able to handle the flows. Uh, so just a little bit about the, the technical aspects of uh, what's happening here at Crystal Bridges looking to the south. All right, so here we are looking uh, back to the north from the dining hall. You get a, uh, a sense of just kind of the overall scale of the project. Uh, the pond behind me, about a million and a half gallons of water. Um, off to my, uh, off behind me, you can see the, the labyrinth weir and see some of the, uh, kind of the zigzag nature of the geometry uh, underneath uh, the north gallery. Uh, gives you a visual of how that three to three and a half foot of open space um, kind of uh, blends in with the buildings, um, both hidden from a visual standpoint but functional from an engineering standpoint, and just the opportunity to, to see just from scale of just how small of an opening uh, that we're putting 4,000 cubic feet per second through that, uh, through that labyrinth weir. Uh, underneath the building. The other thing that's interesting from up here, you can see the, uh, uh, the sanitary sewer uh, tunnel uh, that runs through the length of the project, uh, a main 36-inch um, line, uh, a main sanitary trunk line for the city of Bentonville, uh, also runs through the project, which complicates things a little bit. Uh, so there's a quarter of a mile of, uh, almost a quarter of a mile of tunnel uh, for sanitary sewer uh, through this part of the project. Uh, under the buildings, around the weir, uh, all those complications that go with it. But uh, again, just a, another perspective of what the architect had in mind in terms of being able to see and have the water feature as a part of the overall experience. Mm -hmm.